And good evening, everyone. Welcome to this wonderful webinar presented to you by the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. My name is Bertha Vasquez. I'm the director of TIES, which is a program of the Center for Inquiry. And with me today, we have author Lydia Denworth. And we're going to be talking about her book, which I really enjoyed. Here's my copy, Friendship. Mm -hmm. um, before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to just take care of a few little um, things. First of all, I have placed in the chat my email and the website that um, where we have all of the wonderful resources for teachers on evolution education. So please check that out. And the reason my email is there is because we will be raffling off two of these books at the end of the evening. So I'm going to need your personal address or your school address so that I can mail these books to you directly. The other reason my email is there is because welcome teachers from North Carolina and welcome teachers from Oregon. I know you are using this uh, workshop as professional development. If you email me, I'll be more than happy to create a certificate for you. Um, I also have, uh, I see some students in, in here today, and I just want to remind everyone that you pretend that this guest speaker is in front of your classroom <laughs> speaking, and so you behave in the chat the same way you would behave if uh, Lydia was speaking in front of your class, okay? And last thing, if you have a question and you put it in the chat, it kind of disappears after a while. So there is a little section at the bottom there called ask a question. Please go ahead and put your questions there. And at the end, I will make sure to get as many questions in to our author today. So let me introduce to you Lydia Denworth. She is the author of two previous books, as well as a contributing editor for Scientific American. And she is a blogger for Psychology Today. Her work is supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. In the book we'll be discussing today, Friendship, she takes us in search of friendship's biological, psychological, and evolutionary foundations. She finds friendships to be as old as early life on the African savannas, when tribes of people grew large enough for individuals to seek fulfillment of their social needs outside of their immediate families. So I'm really excited to uh, pass the mic on to our speaker today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Bertha, for having me. Hello, everybody. It's great to see so many people from so many different parts of the country and the world. Um, and I guess these are the wonders of digital technology. This is the good side of it. Uh, so I am going to give me a second. I'm going to share my screen here with you all um, and uh, and just get this going. OK, um, so. Uh, I am going to talk to you about this science of friendship. And, you know, I am a science writer, as Bertha said. Um, these are the, some of my books. Or, and part of my job is to go out and talk to scientists about what they're working on, what they think is interesting. And I also like to listen in when they talk to each other. Uh, and about five years ago, I went to a conference for a field called social neuroscience, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's the sort of subsection of studying the brain and thinking about all of the ways that the brain is social and what that means and how it works. And while I was there, I noticed that a lot of the scientists were talking about friendship and they were talking about the biology and the evolution of it. And that intrigued me because what they were saying was that friendship was much more central to our existence than most people realized, that it wasn't just nice to have, but it was essential for survival. And I hadn't thought about friendship quite that way before. And I figured if that was true of me, it was probably true of others. So I decided to write this book that you see here on the right. Um, and I wanted like the scientists, basically to answer the question of what friends are really for. And so to do that, I started out by tracing the evolution of scientific thinking about friendship. And this is a really new science. Um, and in order to properly appreciate friendship, first we had to appreciate relationships, actually. 
uh, and the fact that they had biological and evolutionary importance. Not too surprisingly, that began, the shift in thinking really began with how scientists thought about mothers and babies, because that's a much more obvious biological and evolutionary story. Most famously, British psychiatrist John Bowlby developed attachment theory. Attachment theory, according to Bowlby, is a set of behaviors that amount to a survival strategy. Babies need to get their parents to care for them. And they do that by being really cute and cuddly, <laughs> um, by signaling their needs. Um, but the thing is that a lot of people don't realize that Bowlby had this evolutionary bent and he was joined by other scientists who studied behavior in animals. And they saw similar patterns in animals. So you see this baboon mother and baby here. Perhaps you've heard of psychologist Harry Harlow, who showed that if young rhesus macaque monkeys are separated from their mothers, they don't develop normal social behavior. And a British ethologist named Robert Hind served as John Bowlby's guide to evolutionary thinking. He also, by the way, served as PhD advisor for Jane Goodall when she went to uh, Cambridge. Hind helped Bowlby think through the ways that attachment might be related to life and death. And these men really were the first to think about relationships in this way, in this scientific way. Hind defined relationships as the result of repeated interactions where you develop a shared history and the content of your relationship evolves over time and it keeps changing. And if you think about that with your friendships today, you can just think about how each time you see someone, you kind of build on what happened the last time you were together. That was a revolutionary way of thinking about relationships at the time. Okay, but still friendship, <laughs> Friendship was the last kind of relationship to come under the microscope. It was literally the F word of science. That was the title of a paper in the 1990s, which asked if friendship was an appropriate word and subject to study. Friendship was seen as kind of unscholarly. It was squishy. <laughs> and evolutionary biologists wondered if animals could even be said to have friends, right? They, they tended to avoid anthropomorphizing, right? Assuming that animals are like humans. Um, and the thing is that animals are gonna end up being really, really important in our story here. But it's not that we didn't appreciate friendship at all or think about it. Actually, all the way back to Aristotle, and the ancient Greeks, we've appreciated the pleasures of friendship. We knew that it was really, really enjoyable and felt valuable. Aristotle knew that we were drawn to similar people and that it took time to develop a friendship, even if you like someone the minute you meet. And he knew that there were different kinds of friendship. But mostly over all the thousands of years since Aristotle, we have thought of friendship as cultural, as a product of human society and language. But then we started to notice it, friendship or something like it, in other species. That was most obvious in non-human primates like the rhesus macaques on the left there or the chimpanzees on the right. Uh, but elephants also bond, they're famous for their lifelong bonds. And zebras tend to hang out with the same animals in the herd more often than chance would predict. And those are not always their relatives. And even zebra fish have behaved differently in the presence of familiar fish and unfamiliar fish. They freeze when there are strangers around and they relax when they're, when they're with their school, their pals. <laughs> this means that friendship is not just a product of human culture. There's a much bigger story here. And scientists set out to tell that story and to do that, though, they had to begin by defining friendship. And that was not so easy. And that, that squishiness of friendship is one of the reasons that it had not been studied, because science requires something measurable that you can, where you can have outcomes to look at and variables. So they had to, to figure out what it was exactly or what it was going to be that they were going to study. Now, there are definitions out there. Here's a pretty famous proverb, a friend helps you move, a good friend helps you move a body. 
This is attributed to various cultures around the world. Um, and this is one way to define friendship. It makes people laugh and it does get at some of the deep loyalty that many of us feel is part of friendship. But obviously covering up our murder should not be our, our main definition here. And beyond that, friendship is kind of hard to measure. The easiest way to do it is to pin it down in other species because you can strip out all of the complex variables of human existence and you can sort of get down to brass tacks and then you can apply what you learn back to people. And when they did that, in um, mostly in macaques and in baboons, biologists found that at its simplest, friendship has three essential characteristics. It's long lasting, it's positive, and it's cooperative. It can have other things like trust and loyalty on top, but it needs to have these three things. And interestingly, when an anthropologist went looking for friendship across many of the cultures of the world, he found very similar themes to what the biologists found. Most people said that friendship makes you feel good, that it involves a willingness to help, especially in times of need, and that it involves gift giving. Now that's different. <laughs> we don't have that in the baboons. Um, and you might think, and I sort of did when I first heard this, that the gift giving part is a sign of how shallow we humans are. But actually the gifts, it's not really about the value of the gift. The gift is a way of showing the value of the relationship. And so it's interesting that that is so universal across human cultures. And many gifts are really inexpensive or fleeting, like cut flowers that will die. But my favorite definition, and you'll see that there's these themes repeat, um, they're related. My favorite definition comes from a study um, that developmental psychologists did in very young children. And they asked three year olds to talk to define a friend and those or to describe a friend those three-year-olds said a friend does three things a friend plays with you shares with you and doesn't hit you <laughs> um, see remember the positive making you feel good part it kids back now in addition to working on defining friendship scientists started measuring its effects they went looking for evidence that it mattered and they found it. These are just some of the greatest hits of this effort, some of the most famous studies that have been done. And this is what happens when scientists start to take friendship seriously. So what did they find? Well, it's important to know that to begin with, the second half of the 20th century, in that time, there was a shift in the focus of medicine and public health away from infectious disease Coronavirus notwithstanding, infectious disease has mostly been less of a concern because we have had vaccinations, sanitation, antibiotics, and so on. And so because of that, we started looking for the causes of chronic diseases like cancer and heart disease, and they all were taking over the top spots as leading causes of death. And the causes of those kinds of problems lay not in viruses and bacteria, but in the way people live their lives. In humans, so epidemiologists and sociologists started with these large scale studies following thousands of people for years. And mostly they were evaluating changes in their physical health by subjecting them to regular medical exams. But they also asked, a couple of very basic questions about social networks. Like, are you married? Do you belong to a social organization? How often do you see your family or your friends? And 10 years later, 15, 20 years later, when they went and they looked, they combined the social information that they had with the health of the people in the studies, they found some very interesting things. They began to find that the more socially integrated people were, the longer they lived. Now these researchers were looking at mortality because it was easy to measure. You're either dead or you're alive. And it was, you know, there was no arguing about it. Um, and they weren't saying at this point that one thing caused the other, they just noticed this correlation. I'm sure all of the science teachers spend all their time explaining the difference between correlation and causation, but correlation is that two things are happening at the same time, but they may or may not be related. Causation is that we know that one causes the other. 
And so they found a correlation between social relationships and health. And in fact, in this major study in California, you can see that the people at the start of the study in 1965 who were, had fewer friends and less social activity were more likely to have died nine years later. In 1988 was perhaps the most famous study um, in science. It's really the thing that put this issue on the map. Um, and this was the study that for the first time showed that a risk or sh made the connection between social isolation and smoking. Uh, and what they found was that it seemed that social isolation doubled the risk of mortality and that that made it as risky as smoking or obesity. You've maybe seen some headlines these days that say that being lonely is as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Well, this is where it that idea started. Um, and as now that study in 1988 had only six big studies in it. It was a, a review of looking at all of them. But but this work has continued over time. And so much more recently in 2015, in a meta-analysis, so a, a study of studies combining data, combined data on 3.4 million people from hundreds of studies, and the effect was still really powerful. So the chance of dying earlier increases for those who interact with fewer people who are socially isolated, for those who feel lonely, and for those who live alone. You can see it's from a quarter to a third of a percent um, of increased chance of early death. Now, meanwhile, in Africa, primatologists were doing something else. They were there were teams of them engaged in long-term field studies of baboons, and they were following the same troops for generations. The same a troop is a group of baboons, right? And I think of these scientists as kind of exacting gossip columnists who are recording exactly who does what to whom and then trying to measure what it gets them. And while they were doing this, they were watching the female baboons and they noticed something. So meet Sylvia. Sylvia was a baboon who lived in Botswana. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that Sylvia was actually really nasty. <laughs> she treated most of the other animals in her troop very badly. And she spent most of her time with her primary grooming partner, which was her daughter, Sierra. But then Sierra was eaten by a lion. Sylvia started trying to make friends with the other baboons. There's a grunt that baboons give that sort of means that they come in peace. It's a way of signaling that. And that behavior really surprised the primatologists and got them thinking, like, why would Sylvia be doing that? What was in it for her? How, why would she change this lifetime of behavior suddenly? And so intrigued, what they did was they took years of their data and they decided to look at the strength of social bonds between the baboons and compare it to reproductive success and longevity. So reproductive success is how many babies you have and how long they live, how healthy they are. Uh, and longevity is obviously how long you live. Um, now, baboons are very hierarchical, and Sylvia was actually quite high up, like a duchess in her troop. Um, and the scientists had always assumed that the position in the hierarchy should matter most of all. But contrary to their expectations, they found that it wasn't where a baboon sat in the hierarchy that mattered most. It was the strength of her social bonds. So those with the strongest bonds lived the longest and had more and healthier babies. So in evolutionary terms, you cannot do better than that, right? That's what you want. You want to have babies and you want to live a long time. Traits like being sociable, like being good at making friends, arise because they help individuals who possess them solve problems. They give those individuals an advantage over others in survival and reproduction. So what the scientists in Africa had uncovered really was that there was an evolutionary advantage to being good at making and maintaining friends or strong positive bonds, if we wanna put it in baboon terms. And in effect, there has been a survival of the friendliest. 
not just of the fittest, or if you want to put it another way, you could say that the fittest were the friendliest. Now, why would this be true? Friendships are relationships that exist outside of the body, and the fact that they get into our cells and affect our health is astounding, really. It's what tells us just how important friendship really is. But how does it work? How do friends get under our skin, to put it the way biologists do? What is friendship doing inside the body? Well, we have come to understand that the psychological is biological. We take in the world, including the words and actions of family and friends, through our hearing, our vision, our sense of touch, etc. And our nervous systems respond by sending signals to our heart and lungs and muscles about what to do next. Now, loneliness, interestingly, is a psychological state that has a biological effect on us. And it's important to point out that in this science, what we've come to understand is that loneliness is not the same thing exactly as social isolation. Loneliness is, the, is subjective. It's the feeling of a mismatch between the amount of social connection you want and the amount that you have. Social isolation is more objective. It's an actual accounting of the number of social connections you have and interactions that you have. So social isolation is what a lot of us have been experiencing during this pandemic. Um, and solitude, on the other hand, is the word we use to express the joys that we sometimes feel in being alone. And there are, are plenty. Um, some people like it more than others, but I just wanna throw that in there to say that that is a different thing. Now, psychologist John Cassiopo, who pioneered the research into loneliness, actually came to think of it as the body's response to disconnection, a signal that you need to get out and see people. It's the relational equivalent of hunger or thirst. And in fact, early in 2020, a team of neuroscientists at MIT showed deep inside the brain that loneliness looked like hunger pangs which was really interesting. Now, the, on the flip side, the contentment we feel when we're with our friends is also really powerful. And, and it's how we know that there's also a biological effect to the good, right? So these two things, loneliness and friendship, are two sides of the same coin. They're basically the opposite ends of the continuum for how socially integrated we are. And now we know that they affect all kinds of bodily systems. So here's the list you've been looking at a little while. They affect how your heart rate works, your immune system, the quality of your sleep, your risk of depression, your risk of dementia, how well you respond to stress, and even the rate at which your cells age. And we can talk later. It's complicated to get into the specifics of how, but we can maybe in the questions, I, if you want to know more, I can get into some details. Um, now, I hope that I have convinced you by now that friendship is important. And I just want to talk a little bit about what it looks like across the lifespan and how it plays out. Um, we've seen these kids before. Remember, they were three. Uh, and for them, a friend is someone who plays with you, who shares with you, and doesn't hit you. Because when you're that age, children have pretty concrete ideas of what a friend is. Things get subtler and more emotional as we get older. When kids go to school, they start to learn things from friends that they can't learn from parents, which includes trust, loyalty, and importantly, how to provide support and not just receive it. So they have more horizontal peer-to-peer -peer relationships. In middle and high school, a child's social life becomes critically important. I would go so far as to say that middle school is about lunch <laughs> because that's where kids have the most agency and it's where adults who want to know how things are going for any one kid should probably look. Is a child the girl on the left or the girl on the right? Um, now, the other really important thing is adolescence. If you want to understand friendship in adolescence, it helps to understand the teenage brain. So from a neuroscience perspective, adolescence stretches from the age of 10, right at the beginning of puberty, all the way to 25. 
that's how long it takes for the brain to fully mature. And there is a developmental gap in this time between the emotional parts of the brain, the limbic system, and the sort of more rational parts of the brain in the prefrontal cortex right at the front that control logic and reasoning and judgment. Um, and the thing is, we now understand that that's evolution designed it that way, that, that a lot of what leads to kids' impulsivity and sensitivities to social things is by design. They're never going to be more sensitive to acceptance and rejection than they are as adolescents. Um, and they have an increasing sense of self. So it's no surprise that friends are such a central part of your life when you are a teenager. Um, now, then comes adulthood in your 20s. Often people are still hanging out with their friends, but then in their 30s, they raise families, they have careers, and suddenly it feels like they never have any time for friends. Um, and then finally at the 30s, 40s, 50s, I'm skipping quickly here, <laughs> the later in life when families are raised and careers are finished or are reduced, we tend to have a little bit more time to spend with our friends. And studies bear all of this out. So in a study where um, researchers got, basically they contacted everybody, they had adolescents all the way up to um, senior citizens in this study, and they asked them every couple of hours how they were spending their free time and with whom. And you can see that adolescents were spending 30% of their free time with friends, middle-aged adults only 4%, and then older adults, it inched back up, but only a bit to 8%. Um, so time is a really critical piece of friendship, not just for humans actually, but for animals too. So the grooming and things that the animals do, that's how they spend a really good chunk of their time. Um, it means in humans that time, people are a really good use of our time, especially if you prioritize the people who matter most to you. And now here's how psychologists think of it. They use concentric circles to represent close relationships. Um, and most of us have something between two and four people in our inner circle. Uh, well, sorry, no, two and eight, the average is four. Um, and that can be family, it can be friends. It's often about half and half. Um, the next circle might be the 10 to 15 people that you would invite to your birthday party. And then the outer circle is people you care about but see less often, other classmates, colleagues, extended family, neighbors, and so forth and so on. In all of these relationships, this new science of friendship has shown us that the quality of relationships is what matters the most for your health. And it's what had the bang for the buck, right, for the baboons and the evolutionary work. And so remember that our working definition of friendship is that it's long lasting, positive and cooperative. Well, what relationship in your life most neatly meets that definition? Often it is your closest friend. Those are the people with whom you have long, reliable bonds that make you feel good. And those are the people who are there for you when you need them and vice versa. Those are the benefits of friendship. So what are friends for? Friendship is about helping us get through the stresses of day-to-day -day life. We get all the good stuff that comes from it so that it feels rewarding in our brain. Literally, dopamine and other neurotransmitters are telling us that this feels good. And that keeps us motivated to engage. It keeps us coming back for more. And the reason our bodies want us to do that though is so that we build up a relationship with those repeated interactions. And then we have a bench of people to rely on and back us up when the hard times come. Now, interestingly, the science clarifies what friendship is in the ways I've described, but it also blurs the lines about who can be considered a friend. So the word friend is qualitative, not categorical, right? Um, we use it to describe sometimes a sibling or a spouse if we want to indicate that there is value added. If you want, if I want to tell you that my marriage is really healthy, I'll tell you that my husband is my best friend. 
Um, a lot of people who have siblings say that their siblings are their best friends, maybe not when they're young, often when they're adults. Um, but interestingly, not everybody sees it in the same way. I'll just quickly tell you about a study that was done in Jacksonville, Florida and Mexico City. And they asked people in each place, do you think of your spouse as your best friend? In Jacksonville, it was something like 60% said yes, they did. And in Mexico, it was more like zero. <laughs> Nobody did. And we don't think that that is um, a sign of the difference in, you know, of unhealthy relationships in Mexico. It's a difference culturally in whether you would use the word friend to describe your spouse. But for my purposes and our purposes, I think that what we really need to remember is that this question of quality bonds that make you feel good and that are good for you is what we're after whoever we're talking about. It can be kind of a template for the relationships in your life. And so keeping that in mind, we should work to be a good friend and not just expect it from our friends. And so what does that mean? Well, I think that we can use the science to sort of come up with, to echo the debt, we can echo the definition of friendship in this idea of how to be a good friend. So we can be positive, be reliable, and be helpful. Be a steady, stable presence in people's lives, show up, reciprocate, offer help when it's needed, and and try to make sure that relationships aren't too lopsided, right? Those are the things that across all these species we see. <laughs> They're the core tenets of good, healthy, healthy relationships. And I also just want to throw in here, I said that time really matters. Well, you have to put in the time to make a friend. And when a researcher at the University of Kansas counted up how many hours it took people to make a friend, he found that people went from being an acquaintance to a friend after about 50 hours of time together. It took 90 hours to be a good friend, to consider someone a good friend. And it took 200 hours to consider someone a best friend. Now, importantly, just spending time is not the only thing. You can spend hours and hours and hours with someone in class or at work and not become great friends. So that's why you need those other legs of the stool. Now, a little moment about gender because everybody asks. The stereotypes of male and female friendships are somewhat true. Women do friendship face-to-face. -face. They talk and talk and talk about how they feel. And men often do it side by side, which means that they watch sports together, they play sports together, they sit on bar stools next to each other, they play video games next to each other. But what I think is more interesting about friendship and gender is that the similarities far outweigh the differences, actually. Both men and women, boys and girls, all value friendship a lot. And when asked to talk about themselves personally, um, men do feel closer to um, to each other. So women are on to something there. But women don't have a lock on the only way to do friendship. And um, and I think actually it's kind of cultural that we train boys and men not to talk about their feelings. And interestingly, in an experiment uh, known as the 36 questions, well, so it used something called the 36 questions that lead to love. These were questions that researchers created to bring um, couples into the lab and, and, and get them to well, fall in love. One couple actually got married, believe it or not. But somebody used it um, for men. They brought in two straight male friends and they had them do this exercise of asking and answering questions. And what they found, and the questions get more and more personal as you go. And what they found was by the end, uh, the men all reported feeling closer to each other. Uh, so there is something about sharing our lives and self-disclosure that is an important part of friendship, but it's not the only thing. Um, and I don't actually, so here's, here's an example of the 36 questions. Um, these were from the, the beginning is relatively tame. What's a perfect day for you. And then it gets more and more serious as you go along. Um, and I am happen to be the mother of three boys. That's my son on the right with his very best friend. 
uh, and they have a beautiful friendship. It's featured in the book. I find them playing video games together. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I know that they, that um, boys and men have very deep bonds. Um, and I tend to think that women are a little bit too um, uh, arrogant about us being better at friendship than men are. Um, now, what about social media? I get asked about that a lot too, and I have a whole chapter on it in the book. So let's we'll get to COVID in a minute, but we have a history of freaking out about technology. And this particular change feels really seismic. It has saturated society. Um, but right now, of course, with the pandemic, we are rewriting the script on this. Um, we are having to embrace digital technology in a way that we never did because it is all that we have, or, or we have to accept it, I guess, is the way to put it. But what's encouraging is that I found as I wrapped up my reporting that there is a lot of really new, important research on this, and that much of the hysteria over the way social media might be hurting us um, has been overblown. And so you have to remember that the science of how social media affects well-being is very young. And the first such study was done in 2006. Um, and at first, science is a pretty blunt instrument because researchers have to figure out how to do the measuring, how to do the defining, right? They have to know what the outcomes should be. And they ask pretty broad questions. So the early studies were almost entirely about screen time. And we know now that that isn't really a meaningful concept because look at kids today during the pandemic are spending all day on the computer, but presumably a big chunk of that is actually in school. So that's not the same thing as playing a video game. Um, so what matters more is the content and the context of how we spend time online. And these new rigorous studies have shown us that there are positive and negative trade-offs for well-being, um, but all of the effects are small and the largest effect is positive and it's on relationships. The more media we use to maintain a relationship, the stronger that bond is likely to be. That means if you see someone in person, you talk to them on the phone, you text with them, your friends on social media, in all those ways, that's likely to be a tighter relationship. Let's just talk a second about teenagers because that's where most people are most concerned. And this was a very rigorous study from Oxford University in 2019. It studied more than 300,000 adolescents, and it was using data that included all kinds of information about their lives. And so they were able essentially to look at the forest for the trees here. And they saw that technology use, you can see that's the purple bar second from the bottom, uh, it did have a negative effect overall on well being, but it explained less than half a percent of the variation in well being. Wearing glasses, which I do, <laughs> was worse for people's well being. And things like getting a good night's sleep and eating breakfast were much, much more important to the good. Um, so, this is all just to say, not to say that social media or digital technology is all good, but that the science is very new and young and that we need to be improving the questions we're asking scientifically. Um, and the other thing that I wanna point out is that a lot of video gaming is social. Teens, uh, hang on, sorry. Video gaming is social. 97% of boys play video games. 83% of girls play video games. That's cuting, according to the Pew Research Center. And they don't do it alone. Three quarters are doing it with someone else, either in the room or over an online connection. So I'm not saying that kids should spend all their time playing video games, but I do recognize that, um, that adults often don't see the social side. We have a visceral reaction to the video and we're missing the connecting that's going on. Um, it's worth pointing out since we're in a pandemic, that friendship is really about protecting us from the lions. For the baboons, that's literal. For us, the lions are figurative, but they're out there. 
Um, and social support is an essential piece of resilience, of coping, of getting through a crisis. Um, it's what all mental health experts will bring up as one of their top things that we need to think about. And that is really what friends are for. It's why it's so important to be connecting virtually if you can't connect in person right now. Um, so a few takeaways quickly. This new science tells us that friendship is as critical for our health as diet and exercise. I think of it as the relational equivalent of superfood. And in a long running Harvard study of adult development, they followed more than 700 men from their whole lives. And they found that the best predictor of health at 80 was how satisfied the men were with their relationships at 50. It wasn't their cholesterol, their professional life, their wealth, any of that. It was their relationships. Um, so if we want to all look like these ladies, <laughs> kicking up our heels and enjoying our friends late in life, we need to remember that friendship is a lifelong endeavor and that it's a muscle that must be worked and that even when time is tight, you ignore your friends at your peril. Uh, and that science has now shown us that it is one of the most critical parts of our lives. Uh, so I thank you for listening to me. I'm hoping, yep, perfect. Okay. We will, um, I'm happy to take some questions. And I know there's so much more to talk about here um, and people probably have a variety of questions, but um, I'm just trying to give you a rundown of the thinking that's covered in the book. Um, if you want more information, you can go to my website or follow me at Lydia Denworth. And also if you go to lydiadenworth.com backslash friendship dash webinar, you can get copies of the slides and you can get, um, something called the playbook, which is a little bit about applying friendship to your life. And you can get a copy. The scientists have graciously let me provide you with a copy of those 36 questions, if that would be interesting or fun for you. Um, so let me just uh, get out of sharing here. There we go. Um, Wonderful. All that right. was great. I, I, I read your book, of course, and I didn't remember yeah the one about your relationships at 50 is the best predictor of your health at 80. Yeah. That gives it's, me hope because I have really good <laughs> friends, you know, including you the go. person, a friend gave me this book. So there you it's, go. Yeah. That's been, that's been happening a lot. It's been something that friends have been sharing, which has been lovely. Um, no, I, that for me was one of the most striking statistics in the book because it's that thing where we just, nobody would really have assumed that, friendship was the thing, right? right? That right. It's not just friendship, it's all social relationships in that study, but um, it really mattered more than anything else, well, um, which is, you know, what those evolutionary biologists in Africa were also showing. That's what's yeah. great is in science, when you get a convergence of information from a whole bunch of different fields, that's when you know you're onto something. Excellent, that's true. Mm -hmm. Let me Let me share some mm -hmm. of the questions here and i could tell this is a science crowd because most of the questions are are kind of sciencey so yeah, here's okay. one from okay. felix um he asks is there any relationship between genetic similarity of two people and the potential for friendship but the, like, yeah it's he's almost going he probably i know he's a student but he probably doesn't know what kin selection is but he's in that ballpark isn't he so that he he is he is but but what I think is really interesting is so um, there are researchers who are who study social network analysis so they you know they build use computers to build these models of the ways that we're all connected multiple degrees of separation and they found they they compared that with genetic information and they found that our friends we tend to resemble our friends. Um, at the level of about fourth uh, at fourth cousins, I think it was. Um, I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but it's so a distant relative. But it it was more the the genetic similarity was more than you would have assumed, um, mm. and it and it was different from the fact that we often hang out or live near people who are maybe the same race or or ethnicity as us. It it rises above that. Um, this was is pretty early work, but it is suggesting, and that question would be, 
how would we know, right, that somebody has the same, gen, uh, you know, a genetic similarity um, to us? And we don't know that yet, but there is that. And yes, so kin selection, I mean, you all, <laughs> you all must spend all your time explaining things like kin selection, but, uh, yeah. but you know, that is the idea that, um, that we are helping our relatives we're, we're moving our genes on by helping even distant relatives um and that it's so it's everything's at the level of the gene but um but that's but i find the this work on um showing this genetic similarity that we wouldn't be really be aware of really interesting um yeah anyway great, that's great, great in question. much more detail from lore we have are there any studies comparing friendships formed in adulthood or later in life versus friendships in youth um do you think go ahead um well so they haven't it's not that they're compared so much as that actually what's striking is that they the similarities are all there so those those basic fundamental pieces of friendship um that i described apply to all kinds of relationships, whether you're young or old. Obviously there can be a sophistication emotionally and um, conversationally and things like that in in more adult relationships, but fundamentally they're not that different. What is interesting is that somebody you've known a really long time. So, um, well, or let me put it this way. I, I said this before, but when you are young, you have so much more time <laughs> to spend yeah, with people I saw that. and to get to know people. And you also tend to be in school surrounded by more people your age or who might potentially share your interests um, than you will ever be again, you know, in high school and college. Uh, and so that's, there's a reason why those relationships um, often become really formative and important. But it's also true, I, I mentioned the adolescent brain and the importance of the adolescent brain. So in adolescence, our, our brains are primed, our memories are actually more keen in adolescence than they will ever be. So they're like the reason things feel really good or really bad, more so than when you're an adult, actually is not something that kids are making up. It's real, that their brains are experiencing it differently. So as you become an adult, you're going to remember those relationships in a different way. I'm not sure if I explained that really clearly, but um, but it's basically that your brain is kind of primed for social interaction when you're an adolescent. But that doesn't mean that you can't have, I mean, that we don't have really deep and satisfying relationships as adults. It also is the case that a lot of people as adults think about have these long-standing relationships but sometimes they find that that long that shared history is not enough anymore and that those mm. you know we, we tend to cling to those relationships but sometimes they're not giving us those other pieces that we need they're not positive all the time or they're not um they're a little lopsided and we, we find people sort of draining so it's sometimes worth asking, this isn't exactly what the question was, but um, it's sometimes worth asking whether just because you've known somebody a long time, like doing a check-in and saying, wait, how healthy is this relationship all the way across the board? Um, um, from David Upegi, we have, is friendship an extension of kin selection? In other words, is friendship an expression of altruistic behavior or is it a more selfish, individual-centered set of behaviors aimed at increasing our own fitness? Can we split? I don't know if we can both. separate those two. It's both. <laughs> yeah, well, it's um, so um, it, is, uh, it is thought that a reciprocal altruism and the idea that um, that you know that kind of you wash my you you help me I'll help you um, is fundamental to what kind of um, well has something to do with the social brain the development of the social brain and things like that and that yes that is a sort of foundation for friendship um, but it's it's also true I mean I I so I guess I would argue that. Well, in selection, okay, so in its purest form, the idea of sacrificing yourself for a, um, a relative and passing on the genes is obviously pure altruism. But 
most of what we do that is altruistic is also um, there's something in it for us, I think, um, is how the I to me how the science uh, shakes out, and that um, and so friendship is very much about um, the self. Yes. It's about your own. So there's a theory about the amount of energy that you have to put in, um, and and that the benefits need to outweigh the physical, the energy costs of of the relationship, um, and so. We don't usually think about relationships in that way as having energy costs, but if you're thinking biologically and if you're thinking genetically, of course you do. Um, and uh, and so that it's sort of hard to, I mean, it's, it's, I don't think it means, I don't think it diminishes the importance of friendship to say that that there is something in it for us, you know, is as well as our friends. I'm not answering that. Um, I hadn't thought about it that way in a while, so <laughs> I'm a little loose on my kin selection. But I think of some of my friendships I've dropped along the way as energy in versus energy out, but let's not go yeah. there. I love this question. I just <laughs> touched about it. Uh, her name, Nafisa Haq, mm -hmm. is asking, since socialization is so important for the adolescent brain development, this might be mm -hmm. too too new. But is there any known effects of quarantine and the lack of socialization on adolescents right now? Great question. Do we have it? It's so new. Yeah. No, we don't have it. And and the other truth, the other fact is that um, it is unlikely that this kind of social isolation that we have um, is really going to have um, that profound of an effect, like on our brains or our. So what we have is animal studies of um, actually completely isolated. Like, I mean, not doing this, right? Not talking with, or well, not, I'm sorry. Animals, we're talking about animals here, <laughs> not talking. Um, but so they take, they take mice and rats and they put them in alone in cages um, through adolescence. And then they see, and then they bring them back and then they see um, real changes. It's like what Harry Harlow did with the monkeys, except that they're able to go into their brains and see changes that um, are alarming actually. Um, but, um, but that is a really extreme situation that doesn't isn't what we're talking about now during the pandemic. Um, but it is, and it is true that there is, I mean, actually going to be incredible science that comes out of yeah. this pandemic, not just the viruses and yeah. the, you know, and and um, vaccine science and and all of that and epidemiology, but the social side of it is fascinating and and the social media side of it i think is i uh, one researcher i talked to said that she thinks that that field is going to leap ahead 10 years they're going to skip over you know all the conversations about what it's displacing and they're going to get to the question everybody wants to know which is how valuable is it to have a social uh, interaction online and does it how much of a difference does it make if it's a video chat like this versus a text or a email or a phone call. Um, and we don't have that. Like nobody was studying that because nobody was funding that work actually. I, I know scientists who tried to get to do those studies and they couldn't get any money. Now they're getting money to do that. Um, and and so, and I mentioned that study at MIT um, about loneliness in the brain. So deep in the midbrain, it looked like hunger cravings. And uh, and that was literally the first time. So for 20 years, that's been a dominant theory of loneliness and social, the, the study of friendship and loneliness, that loneliness is this biological warning signal, but we hadn't actually seen it before. So we're just, that just, I mean, talk about fortuitous scientific timing. That paper, it was a preprint, let me say. Uh, it was not, it hasn't been through peer review. You, but it was published in March, I think, February or March, um, as a preprint, and it's a very, very prestigious lab out of MIT. So I think it's it's uh, it's a really good paper. Um, but that was literally the first time that had been done. So that question about what are the effects of this, um, you know, yeah, it's going to be a long time before we know, and I don't know whether there will be enough extreme behavior actually to show up in that way. 
Um, right. So it might be more interesting what psychologists find in mental health. That's uh, there's a lot of research on that on coping and um, how people are getting, how their mental health is changing week to week. There are studies like that that have gone on all year, and that are going to be interesting. I hate to cut this short because there's quite a few more questions that I would love to ask and I don't want to skip questions. Um, so here's one from Angela Dixon. She was, do we see the same types of physiological responses in other animals? For instance, if dopamine is released in response to friendship or if heart rate is affected mm -hmm. in humans, do fish? I, of course, we know the, the, the primates and stuff. The primates, have, yes. Do yeah, fish show fish. very amounts of dopamine re release or? You know what? I Okay, I can't off the top of my head remember about the dopamine in the fish, but it is definitely true um, that we see, uh, we see, yes, we see fundamental sort of basic uh, brain, social brain behavior in even in fish and very much more simple animals. And if I'm remembering, it's been a little while since I read this study, it is mentioned in the book, but I'm pretty sure that there is a study of fish where they showed that um, that like the female fish, if they were watching their male fish fight, the female fish felt like they, they show signs of, That's um, in of the stress, book, yeah. right? That is in the book, right? Yes. And, and um, uh, am I remembering it correctly? Yes, it's been a that, is correct. that um, is correct. And so it shows that there's this basic social connection. That's like a, it's like in humans, what we think of as empathy. It's like the studies of um, human firewalkers their relatives in the in the stands, right? Their hearts go start racing just like the person walking over the coals is experiencing. Or if you're a parent, you feel that way when you watch your kid, <laughs> you play know, tennis. play tennis, <laughs> do something, right? Whatever it is. Um, and so, uh, so they see those kinds of social things in the brains of of even a fish. Um, I can't remember about the dopamine, but I'm pretty sure that yes, it is. Uh, it, it things like that that those neurotransmitters show up. Um, all over the place. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to bring my one of my best friends right here. <laughs> Hello. He definitely <laughs> releases dopamine in my brain, yes. yeah. and he's going to help me name the winners of the raffle contest. Okay, Excellent. everybody. Um, I while Lydia was speaking, I put all your names on little pieces of paper here. And these are the two names that I pulled out. I hope you're still here. I put my email back in the chat. I have Angela Dixon, actually from Alabama, mm -hmm. whose question was just asked. And Rebecca Stanway, uh, Rebecca Stanway. So <laughs> I hope these two people are still here. Uh, maybe you could say hi in the chat. If not, I, I could pick someone else because mm -hmm. I have more little papers here <laughs> so i hope they're here all again um teachers from north carolina and oregon if you email me i'll be more than happy to send up write up certificates for you ah good angela's still here mm -hmm. write up certificates for you um and please keep keep a schedule of upcoming ties webinars i think these are really fun <laughs> now he's trapped in my wires. And I really enjoyed this one, especially because I really, really enjoyed the book Friendship and the Evolutionary Benefits of Friendship. And I know I'm going to be a healthy 80 year old now, I hope. <laughs> and I just want to say, since everybody was asking about genetics, that there's a whole big chapter um, about the genetics of friendship and all of that, that will go into a whole more detail than you could Oh, want. this! I can't tell you. It's it's. There's almost too many studies in this book. I yeah, mean, it's study after studies, study after you know. study. So I really, really recommend the book, everybody. And I want to thank Lydia for doing this. It's so kind of you to join us tonight and to share all of your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was great to be here. Bye, everybody. Have a safe and great night. Bye. Bye.